My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Oh, the topic today, this is so good because it is so, it's so FOMO Sapiens, and it is really about the power of scarcity, Scarcity is this thing that is used against us all the time. Like you go on a website to buy something, especially travel stuff. They'll say like three seats left or, you know, you have five minutes to buy this. And in the Fear of Missing Out book that came out a couple of years ago that you may have read, and if you haven't considered reading, por favor, I write about the fact that Hotel Tonight uses this thing called the Daily Drop, which is a daily offer that they can give you, basically they serve it up to you when you enter the app and you have 15 minutes to act on it and then it's gone. So it's all about scarcity to get you to do something. And that is why I, when I got this, this, this book in the mail, The Power of Scarcity, Leveraging Urgency and Demand to Influence Customer Decisions, which was written by Mindy Weinstein, PhD, I said to myself, I got to meet this Mindy and I got to have her on FOMO Sapiens because... I just need to learn more about this. And I think we all need to know how the matrix works. So Mindy Weinstein is a leading expert in digital marketing and has been named one of the top women in the industry globally. She is the founder of the digital marketing firm Market Mindshift, and she has trained thousands of professionals from organizations of all sizes, including Facebook, the Weather Channel, and World Fuel Service. She has a doctor of philosophy in general psychology with an emphasis in technology, and she teaches marketing at Grand Canyon University and the University of Denver as well as serving as a program leader for the Wharton School and Columbia Business School. In our conversation, first of all, I just gonna pick her brain. That's what I wanted to do. I was like, let me get this expert on the show and just learn how she sees the matrix, the scarcity matrix, which drives us to do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, cronuts, right? Supreme drops, all this stuff that gets us to line up. I used to line up outside the Apple store to get the new iPad when I could have just ordered it online. I don't know why. I, I just love the rush of it all. So this is a topic that I need help with, and I think a lot of us do. So we're just going to talk about that. We're going to get into the psychology, the physiology of all this stuff, and we're going to learn how to navigate a world of scarcity, how to use it for our advantage, and how to detect when other people are using it against us. So this is just, there's a lot in this show today, great for marketing. If you are trying to market something, Mindy has got all the answers for you. Now, I have a small ask for you. I wish I could deploy scarcity against you, but I would never do that to you. What I will say is if you're interested in this topic, check out my book, Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision-Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. You can get it on Amazon and many other places. If you're in the Philippines, it's in the bookstores there. I was just there. I saw it. It was so exciting. It's all over the place. Pick up the book. I promise you will learn many important things. And it's a fun read. If you like this podcast, you'll love the book. So check it out. All right, commercial over. Now, on to the questions and the interview. As you know, I like to start every interview the same way, so I started our conversation by asking Mindy this, what's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? Ah, oh, that is such a big question, but I have an answer for you, for sure. When I think about the decision that was just probably one of the most important in my career, it's deciding to get my PhD. And I didn't do it right after finishing grad school. I waited years. I had kids, I had a family, had all this going, and I had to really decide, is this something that I want to pursue? And what's I think is interesting is the fact that even though I have a business and marketing background that I wanted to do something different. So I went with general psychology with an emphasis in technology because really at the end of the day, we're always trying to reach people, which means we have to understand people. And that 
whole program, which was way harder than I could have ever imagined five and a half years later after I got my degree. And I feel like my mind just expanded with knowledge, you know, just understanding really how, what drives people and motivates people. And so that's definitely been the big thing that has, when I think about what's formative in my career, it's getting that PhD. Yeah, I love it. And you know, it's great that you, I used to think you had to do everything on like this particular timeline, but that is not the case, obviously, as you show. I just had, uh, I met a woman the other night who basically went to college, ended up having twins, and at the age oh, wow. of 30 something went back and she's in med school, which wow. is sort of like, that sounds, that sounds painful. She looked happy. I don't know how she does it. But anyway, the point is that like, you don't have to necessarily go on the old FOMO sketch. You can do your own thing. Now, today we're going to talk about, you have this new book out, which is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It is so FOMO sapiens, like you were made for this show. The, the name of the book is The Power of Scarcity, Leveraging Urgency and Demand to Influence Customer Decisions. So all you FOMO sapiens out there who are in sales or you're entrepreneurs trying to sell your products, this is a show where we're going to tell you, I mean, it's kind of a little naughty actually, because these are things that like you're going to use they're not bad things, but they, you know, you're using FOMO and scarcity to drive decision making to get people to do things, which is so powerful. And as I was looking at the book, it just made me think about obviously one of the ones that you talk about is just like, you know, this, this, this sort of like the panic buying with COVID. But then I start thinking about all these things, the the cronut line in New York City, which you haven't seen that people will line up to get a cronut, which is, I mean, it's fine, not worth waiting in line. Or waiting outside the Supreme store or like the soup Nazi line, all that sort of stuff. So just to get started, what is this about? Like talk about scarcity. Oh, such a huge topic. So I'll tell you, I need to give you a little bit of background why I wrote about scarcity. Cause that's something that I've had so many just friends and family and colleagues like, why scarcity? For me, you know, when I was in my PhD program and I was studying persuasion and I actually decided with my dissertation to focus on scarcity because I started to realize that when we look at what influences us as people, so not even just customers, one of the huge things is scarcity. And it dates back to early humankind when people were trying to survive and their scarce resources. So it's something that's innate in us. Which means if there's a circumstance where something's hard to get or it's unavailable for some reason or we're just told, no, we can't have it, we feel that inside. And yes, FOMO for sure. And we'll, we'll unpack that. But there's just a lot that goes into that. And so what I found is it's one of the most powerful influence principles out of all the ones that I've studied. And then what happened after I was done with, you know, all of this research and my studies and all of this, then COVID hit. And then I felt like I was watching my dissertation play out in real life. And I realized, wow, this, you know, this really is something that is just so incredibly powerful for all of us. So that gets me back to your question. So what is scarcity? When I look at scarcity, it's really any type of restriction. So it could be a restriction on time. It could be a restriction on supply. It could be a restriction because things are so popular, which it sounds like that's the case for the cronut that you talked about. It can also be a limited edition item offering product because that still has a sense of scarcity because there are only so many made and it's only for a certain amount of time. And within the business sense, the way I look at it is that scarcity exists naturally in a lot of situations. And it's just a matter of communicating it the right way. So you're you're being ethical. You're not doing anything that's a little shady. You know, you're definitely being above board, but you're letting people know that either this product is scarce, your time is scarce, whatever it might be. And it elicits those psychological, really the factors that start to play into how we feel when we're faced with scarcity. All right. So we're going to put your, your PhD to work a little bit because as okay. you're talking about this and I'm thinking about my own research, it's like, okay, let's go back to the earliest humans mm -hmm. running around East Africa 2 million years ago plus. I don't have the perfect timeline. I think we don't quite know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but scarcity was like a very present part of their reality. You know, you had to know 
where to get food and water because that stuff wasn't just, you know, in your neighborhood, in your fridge. Nowadays, scarcity is different because a, a lot of the basics are covered. We live in a time of, you know, obviously, I, I don't mean to, there are a lot of people who don't have what they need. Okay, that that is clear. Like, let's, let's remember that. But for you and me and people listening on their iPhones, we kind of have the basics in terms of food and shelter and light and all the things that we need. So this is a relatively new kind of thing. People live with scarcity for millions of years and now we don't so much anymore. And so scarcity and, and what its role in our life has changed. Now, when you think about that though, how does a feeling of scarcity today relate to like what is kind of hardwired within our DNA as it were? Well, I mean, that is actually the thing is that because it's still hardwired, that's why when and we're faced with the situation, okay, it's not scarce food, scarce water, maybe like our ancestors, but it's we went to the store to buy our favorite product and it was out of stock and you just start to get those feelings. And so they still, I mean, they exist today. What's really interesting is that there have been a lot of studies that look at the brain and activity associated with mm. scarcity. So it's not just people saying, you know, in a focus group, oh, well, I, I want that product because it's almost out of stock or everyone else wants it. So it's not just saying it. I mean, they're hooking people up to MRI scans, showing them scarce conditions and watching the brain activity. So you can't argue with that if you're a person being studied of like, well, that's not how I felt. Well, we can see what's going on in your brain. We, we know what's happening. And some of those things that are firing within the brain, you know, it's showing that when faced with a scarce situation that you're going to make quick decisions because you feel like your freedom's threatened in some way. And so you make a quick decision, you bypass a lot of the normal steps in the decision making process because you want to make sure that you get that scarce product service, whatever it might be. And then the other thing that happens too, and this has come up in a lot of the psychological research is that as much as we make quick decisions and mental shortcuts is how I look at them, we also at the same time, if it takes a little while to get that scarce product or service or whatever it might be, we start to obsess about it just a bit. You know, it's the focal point and we continue to think about it and we're going to take steps to get that item. So that's what's interesting is that it is still hardwired. It's just a different situation, of course, and they're not necessarily always things that we need to have but our brains still are going to say, okay, I want that item. And it's going to hyper-focus. FOMO. FOMO. Let's talk about an example. I mean, you studied how people deploy this. For those of us who maybe we're launching a company or we have a product that just is not moving off the shelf. It's like, I built this nice thing that nobody wants. How can we learn? Like, what's a great example of how this has been masterfully used to get people to move and make a purchase decision. Right, okay. You know what, I have a lot of them. <laughs> so I'm gonna give good. you more than one, if that's okay. Go for I'm gonna it, give I you, mean, this is I'm great. Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna give you the, the big one that as soon as I say it, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's interesting. McDonald's, so we all know McDonald's. And I had the pleasure of interviewing the former VP of global marketing at McDonald's for my book. And so I have his interview in there. And we talked about the McRib. The McRib, which for those who are fans of the McRib, like it's a big deal. Like you are constantly looking out as you drive by McDonald's. Is there a sign that says McRib is here or McRib coming soon? There's actually communities that are all just tracking the McRib and when is it going to appear? Craziness for the sandwich. And so what was so interesting though, as you know, I was doing this research and thinking about this even from a business perspective, because I'll bring it back around, is that the McRib didn't originally like end up on the menu as a limited time offering. It was all the time. So that was, you know, decades ago, they had it on the menu and it wasn't selling well. So then what they did is they took it off the menu and just would periodically release it. But you don't know, like you don't know when it's going to be released or where it's going to be released. And so it's always that excitement and anticipation that people have. And the other thing too with the McRib, and I didn't realize this until I did my interview, was I guess the McRib had a farewell tour, but like multiple times. <laughs> so it never quite did retire, but people got excited. So the fact that it comes back periodically, it creates excitement and it 
really boosted up sales because when you think about it with that excitement, people are going to go to McDonald's, but they're going to buy more than the McRib. They're going to buy their soda, their French fries, their Happy Meal for their their son or daughter. And so those sales go up. So, you know, looking at something from a business perspective, if it's not moving that well, is there something you could do to make it a limited time offering? And that's more for like a product type sense, but services, there's things that you could do as well. And so let me give you an example from a service perspective, because, you know, a lot of times it's easy just to talk about products, but services is actually a huge area that you can use the scarcity principle. So let's say that you're a consultant and you, you know, you have your services that you provide. Well, if you are the actual consultant working with these companies, you only have so much time, like your time is naturally going to have that scarcity factor involved. And so when you're talking to prospects, the little scarcity principle that you can kind of sneak in there, or I should say scarcity tactic that you could put in there is to, you know, talk to this prospect and say, you know, my my time you know, is limited. I only work with this number of clients at a time. You know, I am interested, you know, in your project or in this work, you know, but I'm very selective on who I'll work with because again, my time is limited. And it's interesting because that's something that, um, I've seen over and over because I've heard stories of that. I've interviewed people about that. And it's amazing that little thing, what's going to happen. You say something like that, and then that prospect's going to spend the next part of the conversation trying to convince you why you need to work with them. And so it's just amazing. So those are just a couple of examples, but there are really just, I mean, I could go on. Actually, I wrote a book about it. (laughs) I was going to say I could write a whole book about it. Actually, I did. So there's so many different examples. But what I really like about the idea of incorporating scarcity is that no matter what size your business you're in or what type of industry or what you're providing services or products, it doesn't cost you anything to just communicate scarcity. And again, to do it the right way. And so McDonald's was a bigger example. And we're talking about a product to make it in a limited time offering. But like I said, you could do that with services. Can I give one more example? I actually have one more. That is really you can. good. <laughs> Just because okay. you asked so nicely. Keep going. Okay. All right. So another example, and this is actually a... Um, a jewelry business, and I included them in the book too. And they're e-commerce based. And so one of the things for them, which is like a lot of e-commerce businesses where, you know, you do have that concern of, I don't want to run out of stock, you know, worrying about, you know, am I going to sell out? And then I'm going to miss out on sales and people are going to be upset. And so that was something that when I was talking to this owner of this jewelry company, uh, e-commerce that she had mentioned, but what happened is the product did sell out, you know, here and there. And so they would notify customers and they would notify customers if it sold out and when it was restocked. And they found that when they would send an email and it was just by accident, they sent an email out, it said restocked and immediately they sold out of that product again. So it doesn't cost money to add a word, you know, to your communication, but again, you're, you're being, really informative and helpful to your customer because you're saying, listen, you know, this is back in stock. And then it does elicit that feeling of scarcity and all that goes on with it. Yeah. What's so interesting about this is that people are more interested in avoiding pain than getting benefit. Mm -hmm. And like, there's like that fundamental trigger. And, you know, as I think about this, just your example about the consulting, and I've done this in my own life. It's like, you know, you have a person maybe who approached you about doing a speaking gig or something. And you're sort of like, great. And you send them all the info and then they don't get back to you and they're, they're not responding. And the minute you say to them, Hey, by the way, I have another potential commitment coming up. So please let me know they get back to you within five minutes. And so it is incredible to me, the power. And, you know, you have to obviously be, we'll get into this in a sec, because I do want to talk about the honesty versus, you know, if you're just making stuff up all the time, that can really backfire. But if you really do have scarce resources and you say, listen, you know, I'm a busy person, I'm scheduling out my life, please let me know. People will get back to you right away that would have just kept, because they have, you know, fear of a better option. They'd love to string it along forever. And so they're forced to respond. The other thing I'll say that that I kind of got a kick out of as you're talking about the McRib is, I don't know if you knew this, Mindy, but <laughs> McDonald's did a whole ad campaign called FOM, Fear of Missing Out on McRib, <laughs> which I thought was really funny because like I'm I'm plenty fine missing out on the McRib. I'm, I'm going to be 
going to be good with that. But it is interesting how they've taken a very, I mean, I'm sure it's a good product if you like a McRib, but it's it's kind of like, it's a product that is, it's not like it's a luxury good. They have taken something right. that everybody can, you know, within reason can afford, and they have created a mystique around it simply because it appears and disappears. And in fact, McDonald's seems to use that playbook all the time. They do that also with them, um, with that Monopoly game that is so fun oh, and addictive, yeah. right? They bring that out and it's like, all of a sudden it's like, you know what, maybe I will go to McDonald's today and get myself <laughs> some sort of like, I don't know, hash brown or whatever the heck they serve these days. So it, it's very interesting. Now I do, I, I, I tee this up and, and I want to hit it, which is like, I imagine some people are tempted to create false scarcity. And so how do you yes. think about that within the realm of this entire topic? Okay. And that is actually like, I can try to communicate that over and over again in the book, because as powerful as scarcity can be, if you approach it the wrong way and you're deceptive, it can completely backfire on you and it hurts your reputation. And so I'll give you an example of one backfiring in a moment, but I first want to talk about why, besides the obvious of it's not ethical or honest, of why you don't want to do that. We live in a day and age, we all know this, where you can just go online and you can look up a company, not difficult at all. And so having any type of false scarcity where you're trying to claim that something is sold out when it really isn't sold out, or you are, you know, messing with the quantities online, just again, to, to show that there's some type of scarcity people will talk. We have so much power as consumers. They will go to social media. They will go online. They'll give you bad reviews. And it's very hard to undo that. And that's really what you have to be so careful of because once your reputation is damaged, it's going to take a long time to overcome that. So whatever you might have gained in the short term for doing some type of scarcity message that wasn't true, the loss that you're going to have is going to be way worse and it's going to be longer. So you have to be careful with it. But there was one, and I actually included the story in the book, but there was a um, example of a company and they're also an e-commerce, a cosmetic company. And they had, you know, on their website, like a lot of e-commerce where it said like how many units were left. That's scarcity, by the way. If you ever see like five left, any of that, that's scarcity because now we're looking, watching the demand and we're watching the supply go out. But they had that on their site and it said one left of whatever, it was some cosmetic product. Well, uh, this woman purchased the product, then just out of curiosity, so she purchased it and went through the whole thing and then decided just to ref like go back and refresh the page out of curiosity, you know, is, does it show now sold out? It didn't. Instead, it said five left or three left or something like that. And so right away, it's like, wait a minute, I just was tricked. So she went to the different social platforms to see like what's going on, went to Twitter and realized that a lot of customers were complaining about the same thing. And so all over Twitter, she ended up going to Reddit. I think she like th these customers were posting on Instagram. So now you've got this like widespread people know and it hurts your reputation. So again, in the long run, not worth it whatsoever because people catch on. And the, what I like to think too with scarcity is that you are really trying to inform your customer. And yes, of course, we're business people. We want to make sales, but for informing them that this is a limited time offering, that's helpful. For telling them that this is running low in supply, again, helpful. That this is, you know, our most popular bestseller, that's helpful. And so it actually builds relationships, but doing it all and just making things up, it's going to do a lot more damage. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah. And you'll have that one customer who has all this free time on their hands, just <laughs> go and trash your reputation. That's like, it's yes. like it's, that's amazing. And, and it is, it is true though. If you, and this is the fun thing about this topic is now that you've heard Mindy talk about it, go on Expedia and try to buy uh, an airplane ticket or, you know, go to your, your American airlines or whatever British airways. And they deploy these little tricks on you with everything. Seats left, pricing, um, it'll be, you know, your chance to ensure your flight. They'll give you one chance and it's, oh, it's your last chance. There's all these triggers and nudges that are being deployed around scarcity and purchase decisions. And I think the travel space is particularly a space where they just seem to really use that a lot, much more than in other places. Now, 
as we think about that as consumers, like I don't want to, I don't have time to go to TikTok and complain about, you know, the, the false scarcity that's being inflicted upon me by some brand, but I do want to be able to make better decisions. So how can we, you know, as consumers overcome or at least manage these triggers of scarcity that are being deployed against us mm -hmm. by all of these companies? That's a really, really good question. And, you know, that's one of the things too with this book. I mean, it is a business book, but for us, as cons we're all consumers too. It's good to just know, you know, what's happening. And I'm not going to pretend that I don't ever fall for scarcity messages too, because that just actually shows how powerful it is. I wrote about it, studied it, all of this, and I'm a marketer and it still happens. But the thing about of what you can do is few things. One is understanding the different ways in which it's implemented, you know, and I gave some examples, you know, that's a big thing. But one of the, like I already said, I believe about the mental shortcuts, like you have to stop and ask yourself if you see something that's running out of stock and you're about to hit the buy button online, like that's your mental shortcut. You need to stop for a second because it's subconscious, but you can still like recognize what's happening and stop, think about it. Don't make that impulse decision. You know, you could always come back and I, there is that fear of missing out, no doubt. For, but you need to ask yourself, why are you really making this purchase? Is it truly something that you needed or are you just reacting to the fact that it's about to be gone or you believe it's about to be gone? So being aware of your actions is really important. One of the things that I recommend and I even have to remind myself is, is you know, when that happens, take a day to think about it, or even just a few hours to think about it. Don't just jump on something because it's scarce. That is our natural inclination, but knowing what's going on and recognizing your reactions is going to really help. I just did this. I feel bad now. You're talking and it's like you're inside my head because I was flying back <laughs> from Europe to the US on lot Polish Airways, and they did this thing where you could upgrade and it was an auction and I put a really low bid in. And then they said, if you bid this other amount, you'll be in the first place. And I didn't even think about it. And I bid for it. And like, <laughs> I won, I won the auction. But then I was like, really? Like, was this a good use of money? Like, you know, you're sitting in the seat. You're like, well, like, was this meal all that good? You know, like, was this mm -hmm. cod worth the amount of money I've just spent <laughs> for this upgrade? The cod was not. So I, I get that. And I felt, then I felt just a lot of like, you know, sort of uh, regret, which is a terrible thing. So when, when it is interesting when you give into FOMO and I should be better than that. So I, 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 I'm telling this story because I feel bad about it. But when you give into FOMO and then the thing that you bought, you realize your motivation was competitive or you had been played, you start to feel regret about your purchase decision. Then you don't enjoy it, which really stinks. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one final important topic here. We often talk on the show about FOBO or fear of a better option and the notion that we live in, a, in a, a, an era of, of overwhelming choice. And one kind of nice thing about all of the scarcity is that it makes, makes decisions a lot easier in a sense that like, it's like, well, you, you know, you have this sort of do or die moment now or never, it's going to go away. So if you really want it, great. And so, and a lot of times I think that scarcity, you know, it is the way to really overcome indecision by generating mm -hmm. scarcity. But I would, I guess I would ask, like, do you think in the end of the day, uh, true scarcity ends up making people's lives easier because it just makes the choice so defined? It, that's a really good question. So, I mean, yes, it does make the decision more defined. And like I said, it helps you just, you start to skip certain steps. But I would also say it depends on what it is you're purchasing. You know, if it's something that was, you know, way out of your budget and yeah, you made that decision, obviously that's not, not wise. But if you're on the fence between different options, like you said, and option A is in abundance, option B is running out, you know, option C is in abundance, then in that type of situation, yeah, I mean, it definitely helps. Because when you think about, as I, I know I keep talking about mental shortcuts, but it, our brains are so bombarded. And so our brains are constantly looking for ways to save time, make those decisions, you know, process all the data that's in front of us. And so, yeah, I mean, it can definitely help with that, but it's going to, like, it's going to depend on what the purchase is in terms of your budget. And again, if you're within budget and you're just looking at options, I do think it actually does help. It even helps if you don't know like 
the particular product. Like if you've never purchased this type of product before and you go to the store and you're looking at your options and, and one of them, they're all, well, let's say they're all close to the same price. And one of them is there's only one left of it. Like it does help, you know? And I think that that is not necessarily a bad thing either. Yeah. It comes down to, I think the distillation of this conversation is really when you are making decisions that are based on fear and emotion, Mm -hmm. stop for a second and say, you know, right. what's happening here? Like who, who is controlling my decision? Is it an external? Is it internal? Mm-hmm. If it's external, how can I think about it? How can I make a more sort of thoughtful and mindful decision? And just recognize that there's a game that you are a player in and that there are these things that are being deployed against you and you just want to be smart about doing those things. Now, the book is The Power of Scarcity, Leveraging Urgency and Demand to Influence Customer Decisions. You can find out more at powerofscarcity.com and you can find out more about Mindy at Mindy D. Weinstein on Instagram. Mindy Weinstein, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. This is great. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.